My life changed forever when I heard this phrase, mash potato books. <laughs> Coined by the wonderful Ariel and Raylene from Books Unbound, it means, <clears throat> and I quote, a book you keep meaning to read but keep putting it off. You find yourself saving it for the right time and it just means you end up ignoring it. The reason it's a mashed potato is because mashed potato is Raylene's favourite thing on a Sunday roast plate and she'd always leave it to last, savouring it to be enjoyed when it inevitably ended up cold. <laughs> and I honestly haven't found a better analogy for my bookshelves right now. If you follow me on Instagram, you'll know that I counted my books that I owned at the end of last year and <sighs> <laughs> some home truths were discovered. Of all the books that I owned, 306 remain unread, which is an extortionate amount of books. Although considering I'm averaging between 70 and 100 books a year, not an undoable number and certainly not enough to make me feel well prepared, say, if I had to stay in this house for 10 years, this would not be enough books for me. But while the world outside isn't crumbling and I am marching towards an inevitable mortality moment, I would like to read the books that I'm excited to read while I'm excited to read them. And and this bad habit of separating book buying as a hobby from book reading needs to end. So in this video, I'm going to be taking my first steps towards recovery. I have picked 10 books from my shelves that I have had for a very silly amount of time. So I'm going to shake off the shame, explain to you exactly why verbally I haven't read these books yet. And hopefully through some kind of catharsis or shared shame, I will feel a little bit better about it. And then at the end of the video, I'll tell you my plan on how to remedy this so we don't have to keep doing it. Are you in? Good. The first book on the list is How Should a Person Be by Sheila Hetty. Now I've picked all of these books, not only because I really need to read them this year, but also because I think they exemplify in different ways all the different ways we avoid reading. And this one is a great example because Sheila Hetty is one of my favourite authors of all time. <laughs> She's only released three books, I think. She does a lot of short stories and stuff, but these are her only, she's only got three books. I've read two of them, but this is her most famous one. It's the one that people hold close to their chests and are like, oh, how should a person be? And I think now I'm saying it, the reason that I'm worried to read it is because I like Sheila Hetty being one of my favourite authors. And if it turns out that I don't like her most famous book, I might have to stop saying that. So as long as this is on my shelf and I own it and it's in a row with all my other Sheila Hetty books, I can still be a Sheila Hetty fan. But if we don't get on, my identity has to change. And I don't like it. And the back sounds good too. Sheila's 20s are going to plan. She got married, she hosts his parties, a theatre has asked her to write a play. And then she realises she doesn't know how to write a play, that her favourite part of the party is cleaning up after the party, and that her marriage has made her feel like she was banging into a brick wall. Sign me up, Sheila. It's make or break for us. 2023 is the year. This is the book that I've probably had for the longest. I got this book in 2012. Here's the thing, this is a book about the musical Wicked and it's academic, I think. I wouldn't know, I haven't freaking read it. I wrote my dissertation on the book that Wicked the Musical is based on um, by Gregory Maguire. And after I handed in said dissertation, I realised that this book existed. So I was like, well, obviously I have to read it. And then when it arrived, I thought, what if it points out something about this book and this story that I didn't think of and I'm still waiting for my results and I feel insecure and I don't want to feel silly so I'm not going to read this book that I just paid to have shipped to Wales from America. <laughs> it's called The Wicked Truth by Susan Ross and purely because I don't want to be wrong or have missed something, I am not reading this book even though it's on one of my favourite topics, even though it is a mere 198 pages long. Despicable. I know, I know some of you have done that. John Wyndham's The Day of the Triffids. I'm purely not read, this is a simple, this is a simple problem. I'm not reading this because I know I'm going to really enjoy it. I know how that sounds. 
But in dark times when you're like, what do I even have to look forward to? What even is there left that's new and exciting in this world? I think about the books on my shelves that I know I'm going to enjoy and have lots to say and then want to go and watch all the adaptations of. It's like a window into a world of well deep thoughts that I might need at some point. It's like a first aid kit, a literary first aid kit, okay? I've owned possibly three different editions of this book at various points in the last 10 years. This is the latest one. It's very, very pretty. Um, the other ones I picked up for like 99p from charity shops and then gave away because I was like, look, I'm never actually gonna get around to reading this book. And then it just draws me back in because the plot, I mean, it's about monstrous plants at the end of the world that eat people, but it's like published in the 50s. So there's loads of academic work around it and you could really get into a little scroll internet wiki hole about it. If one were to read it and enjoy it, I imagine. It's gonna be me this year. It's going to be me, John. This is another kind of unique one and maybe only recognizable to the absolute nerds among you, among us. Uh, Reading Lolita in Tehran. This is a book set in Iran in the late 90s and it is about seven young women, all former students, who met every Thursday to discuss forbidden works of Western literature. This is non-fiction and it sounds absolutely freaking incredible. They discuss Pride and Prejudice, The Great Gatsby and Lolita. And the reason that I didn't read this, even though I've owned it, I think I probably bought this during my degree, so probably 2010, is because I hadn't read Lolita and I hadn't read The Great Gatsby and I wanted to read the books that they were referencing before I read this book so I could enjoy it more. I have now read those books, so the excuse is, are running low. Let's do it. I thought about getting rid of this book loads of times. A Reunion of Ghosts by Judith Clare Mitchell. It's a mysterious family drama and the reason that I kept it wasn't because of the cover, wasn't even really because of the premise, wasn't because of the writing, because I don't know anything about the author. It's because in 2015 I went to a book launch that was launching a completely different book in a completely different genre and I knew the author and I went along. I started talking to the publicist and instead of pitching me the book that we were actually at the party to celebrate or anything else that was even vaguely in that genre, she couldn't stop talking to me about this book and her infectious enthusiasm and the fact that I knew that she didn't really have to pitch this to me because it really wasn't the party and this wasn't the thing and it wasn't even like a big book at the time, I don't think it wasn't one that was probably at the top of her professional agenda. Her infectious need for me to read this book has made me keep, that one conversation has made me keep this book all this time. I just have a good feeling about it, okay? If you've actually read this book, let me know below. I wanna know if I'm clairvoyant, if I just, sometimes I just get that gut feeling, but I honestly need to either get rid of this book or read it this year because it's getting embarrassing. There's literally no reason. This book is a proof that dopamine is an effective chemical. Or is it a hormone? Is it a chemical hormone? This book is called Running With The Pack, Thoughts From The Road On Meaning And Morality by Mark Rowlands. And it's basically a, it's like a diet philosophy book, not diet, but like, you know, like a light philosophy book um, about running and why we as a species ran. And I bought it um, when it came out, which was, uh, yeah, 2014, uh, because I really wanted to get into running and um, I wanted to feel like it was a really deep decision and not a really shallow decision. So I bought this book and I got the dopamine because I was like, somebody's written a book about how deep running is. Um, and then I did actually get into running and I still run like three or four times a week now. So I basically got everything I I needed to out of this book without actually having read it and wouldn't it be really freaking funny if it actually wasn't about that at all and it didn't make me feel good about running and it was actually a bit <laughs> and the thought of that ironic situation coming up has stopped me reading it all this time <laughs> well i have a really dysfunctional brain don't i anyway this is jean reese's wide sargasso sea and this is a complimentary clapback title um, to Jane Eyre and it tells the story. See, I can just reel this off. I don't even need to read the blurb because I know, because I know a lot about this book. I've just never read it. It tells the story of Bertha, the locked up attic wife that sets off the middle part of the plot in Jane Eyre. From what I can tell, it's a very heavy critique of dismissing women of colour in classic literature and the secret power of colonialism on texts that we don't think contain colonialism. And um, I want to read it, but I just haven't. 
and I even found this beautiful old vintage copy that was in the yeah printed in 1992 and it's absolutely bloody gorgeous and short with tiny pages and I think because it's a classic I'm like I must be in the right frame of mind to read this book I must absorb it I must give it all of my attention and because I've had a incredibly busy apparently eight years I haven't ever been in the mood where I'm like I can give this book the reverence it deserves and honestly I think the closest to reverence I can give it is to just read it so I don't know why I don't do that. Another book that requires the focus that I am intimidated to try and give it is Proust and the Squid, The Story and Science of the Reading Brain by Marianne Wolfe. This is a book where the concept really intrigues me. From the history of the earliest known examples of written language to whether reading online really makes us stupider and why dyslexia can be a gift, Proust and the Squid will ensure that you never take for granted your ability to absorb the written word. This is published by the first publisher I ever worked for and it was a book that was already out and I just picked it up off the shelves because I was like oh, I want to know their backlist like some of their big books and um, then it just sat there so that one day I could look forward to being smart enough to be able to read it because it's quite I think it's quite heavy in science it's got a lot of diagrams about brains and I just have this preconception of myself as somebody who isn't capable of reading like a whole serious science book and I don't know why that is because I actually have read some and it's been fine so no time like the present apparently actually do you know what my brain is like no time like the future let's just do it in the future this is a children's book by David Armand. I picked this up when I was working at Waterstones in 2013. It's got an amazing, I bought it because it was beautiful. Look at that, like under the dust jacket, like wow. The front is beautiful too. And I just wanted to own a beautiful thing. I'll be honest. It's a children's book about fish and it really shouldn't take me that long to read, but I still haven't because it was almost too easy. I was like, this is a middle grade book. I can just read that whenever. And I didn't. And honestly, with children's books, I feel like I should either be reading them or giving them to an actual child because this is a waste of resources. <laughs> and then finally, Dracula. I own a great copy of Dracula. Look at this copy of Dracula. Have I visited Whitby where this book is set several times? Yes. Have I brought it with me every time I visited? Because I was like, I'll just read it when I'm in Whitby because that will be great. Yes. Um, have I read books based on Bram Stoker? Yeah, I have read books where Bram Stoker is the freaking character. I also had a resolution a few years ago to read more Irish writers and I didn't. So all roads point towards me reading this, but like with a lot of classics, I think they can be intimidating and I always think I should be in a better frame of mind or in a different location, apparently. But maybe I'll go back to Whitby this year, but I think by the time I get there, I should have already read this because now we know that I can't read books set in Whitby in Whitby and that's just data that we can't change so we have to roll with it. Did any of those reasons feel familiar to you? Maybe. Um, if you are like me and you're having these problems you might want to join me in my resolution and the resolution that I am coming to, the way that I'm going to tackle this bad habit of owning books and never getting around to reading them is that these 10 books have to be read by me in the year of our Lord 2023 or I have to get rid of them. No ifs, no buts. And if I do read them, I will upload a little short to this channel. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss it. Um, I'll load, upload a short to the channel reviewing it for you. If I don't like it, I am allowed to get rid of it. I don't have to finish the books, but I have to at least have started them. And if I don't finish them by the end of the year, that has to be what we can't carry on this way. I don't know why I am apparently refusing to read these books, but maybe when I pick them up, I'll find out. But cliche though they are, the reels that were like circulating Instagram at the end of 2022 that were like, burn your best candles, write in your best notebooks, did hit a nerve with me. And I was like, look, I could die. I actually almost did die in 2022. I had a bit of a near like, there's another story, but the point is books are a hobby of mine. I'm supposed to like reading. I'm supposed to be excited about the books that I'm about to read. And as somebody who's job was books for about eight or nine years. It's hard to get into my head now that it is a hobby. I'm supposed to be enjoying it. I don't have to pick up something because I'm doing a degree in it or I have an interview with the author or I have to do a marketing presentation on it. I, I am just allowed to enjoy the books that I own. And if I don't enjoy them, I'm allowed to find them a new home. That has been a pep talk for me, but it might have been helpful for you too. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you'd like to support this channel, there is the Gumption Club, of course, the Patreon group, 
where you get a free podcast from me every week. You get loads of extras and goodies. And I also, whenever I get rid of a book, I usually give it to somebody in the Gumption Club. That is over on Patreon. But I have also turned on channel memberships on this channel. That is for people who don't want any perks. They just want to buy me a cup of tea or a couple of pints as a thank you for the free videos I make. Because I've had some requests to create something else uh, because some people don't want to use Patreon, which is totally fine and they're not bothered about the perks. So if you do want to support me on memberships for literally just my eternal gratitude, I have now turned those on. You might have noticed that we're coming up to our five month anniversary on this channel without a sponsorship. That is because of the wonderful people who tip me for these videos, like I'm a busker in the street to make sure that they keep happening. They keep the lights on, so thank you so much to them so I can keep making these videos for free. I'll leave the links below if you want to become one of those people, but even if you don't, it is always a pleasure to make videos for you and I would love to hear in the comments below which books you're putting off so we can keep you accountable. Uh, if you like this video, I reckon you might like one of these videos. Frog Snog out.